In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Let's rest up as we pray together. It's wonderful to be at the Bible study in Sro Larry. And those who are coming for the first time, where are you once again? Can you raise up your hand? Those coming for the first time. Thank you. You are just like me. I'm here for the first time. And the Lord will bless us together in Jesus' name. And those who are outside, are you there? Those who are coming for the first time through Lyric Bible, Deeper Life Bible Church, where are you? Can you raise up your hand? Okay, I see a few hands there. Uh, the walls uh, stand between uh, you and I. At the end, I'll see your face. You'll see my face. Yeah. And our old timers, where are you? Are you happy to be here today? Yeah. The Lord bless everyone in Jesus' name. Yeah. Father, we thank you for our Bible study. We thank you for such a great time, a glorious time. And we're praying that you bless your people tonight in Jesus' name. Yeah. Touch every heart. Touch every life. Turn us around in Jesus' name. The bodies will bear. We pray that you lift them away. And all the sunny issues in our lives, we pray that you crush them and take them out of every life in Jesus' name. Let this Bible study benefit everyone. I invite you, our newcomers, our friends, our neighbors who are here, and all the members and leaders and workers who are here. Lord, I pray you rain showers of blessings upon everyone. And I pray, Lord, that we'll come in, as we we'll come in and present our needs before you, we'll go away from, from here with joy in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Can see that we're looking at First John chapter 5. I need to make some introductory remarks as we look at this study. I want uh, those who are coming for the first time to know that we are following a series. We just study from book to book in the Bible. And we study from chapter to chapter and from verse to verse. And we do not omit anything. We just go on as uh, we see those verses. So if we read anything or explain anything that appears to uh, come to your situation, understand that as the Lord leads us, uh, we're going from chapter to chapter. The same thing. But those of us who are in Sri Lanka here, uh, some of the verses may appear direct to, you know, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. Understand there's no intention like that. It's just what the word of God says and we need to study the word. And the word of God tells us that we need to study to show ourselves approved unto who? Unto God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, and we need to be faithful to the word of God. Now we're looking at uh, 1 John chapter 5. And I'm reading from verse 14. It says in verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his word, according to his will, he hears us. Here John, the beloved, the apostle of love, is uh, going to tell us some things that are very, very simple. And he's going to tell us some things that are sublime, some things that are very, very deep. As you read the epistle according to St. John, you're going to discover some things are so simple that everybody can understand. Even our little children can understand. As you come to this epistle, you might find that there are some verses that need explanation, that need um, application, and that need for us to compare with other scriptures so that we can get the real meat of the word of God. And so John here is teaching us, he says, we have confidence in prayer. And yet he's going to tell us we have constraint in prayer. Confidence on the one hand, because God says, here is my word, here is my will, here is my promise, and here is my provision. And you pray according to this, that's the confidence we have, is going to answer our prayer. And yet John is telling us, there are constraints in prayer. There are things we want to find out, is this the will of God? Is this the mind of God? God. Is this according to the promise of God? Is this according to the desire and the wish of God? And if it is not, because we're committed to the will of God and we're committed to the word of God, we're constrained to say, okay, I cannot go that area because that is not the will of God. On the one hand, we discover the will of
of God and we have confidence in prayer. On the other hand, we discover that is not according to the will of God and we are constrained in prayer. And so you are going to find those two sides to prayer tonight. As you look at uh, these verses we are looking at, I'm reading verse 15 now, and if we ask, if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. It says we desire the blessings of God and the petitions that we have. And then we look at the word of God and there are so many promises in the word of God we don't need to miss our way. And as we pray according to the promise of God, we remember it's a faithful God. And what he said he will do, he will do. And we come with that boldness to the throne of grace and we receive the blessing of the Lord. Now it comes to a special area. Look at verse 16. If any man see his brother, sin is sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. And here John is uh, touching something that you might not have found other apostles touching. You might not have found other scriptures touching. It says, if you see a brother sin, a sin. And it says, now not unto death. John, what is that? Is sin that not unto death. I thought the Bible says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Yes, that's what the Bible says. And John is now telling us there is a kind of sin which is not unto final death. Which is not unto permanent death. Which is not unto perpetual death. There's a sin which is not unto eternal death. Because there's still a chance to repent. There's still a chance to look up to the Lord. And so we can still pray for that individual. Once there's life, there is hope. Although he has sinned, although he has backslidden, he has not committed the final sin that takes him to the grave. And John says, if you see your brother like that, you see a neighbor like that, you see anybody like that, that sins and it is not unto death, no final death yet, and no permanent death yet, and no perpetual death yet. He shall ask. Then we can pray and we can ask the Lord. And it says, God will give him life for those who have sinned, not unto death. And now he tells us something difficult and something you need expansion on. There is a sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. I'll explain further when I come to that passage, but just as we start, you know, Ananias came and Sapphira, and he didn't know what will happen. And he just came to Peter, and uh, other people have told lies. I'm sure you know that before Ananias. Other people have, have given offering that may not be the full sin uh, before Ananias. But here in the case of Ananias, and we never can tell, and we never know what who this might happen to. And so Ananias came and said, you know, I give my offering. Uh, everybody has been giving offering and uh, Peter never asked them any question and uh, nobody asked them any question but all this particular day Peter happened to ask and said Ananias is this all and he said it's all and the spirit of God said uh, through Peter and said why is it you are lying to the Holy Ghost you have not lied unto man you have lied unto God and as could still have said oh I'm sorry that was temptation. I'm sorry. I, I, mis, I mis, uh, said what I said. I'm sorry. That was a real lie. It was deception. Please forgive me. There will be forgiveness because every sin will be forgiven once we confess and once we turn away. But he confirmed the sin. And then Peter said, that's the apostle, he said, you have not lied to man. You have lied unto God. And all of a sudden, suddenly, he fell down and died without a chance to repent. Paint. And that's what John is saying. John said, if somebody commits sin, but he's still alive, we can pray. If somebody commits sin, and uh, you know, he's still, you know, roaming about his sin, but he's still alive. Once there's life, there's hope. There's hope of salvation. There's hope of forgiveness. And there's hope of eternal life. But in the case of Anas, he committed the sin. He died without a chance. That's final death. That's permanent death. That's perpetual death. Three hours later, the wife came. And the wife, uh, you know, uh, then Peter spoke to the one and said, I Is it true? 
Is that how much you sold that piece of land? And the woman said, yes, that's true because I agreed with my husband. That's what I'm going to tell you. Whatever you ask, this is the answer we have. And he said, why have you agreed together? At that time, she could have said, I'm sorry, Apostle. I, read, I agreed with my husband, but now she didn't know what had happened to the husband. But as the opportunity to confess was there, opportunity of conviction was there, she didn't take that opportunity. And then she fell down. Dead. That's final. That's final. And nobody can come to the burial and be praying after that death. That's what John is telling us that somebody has committed sin and he didn't have a chance to repent or he had a chance to re repent he didn't repent and now he is dead we cannot bring the cop in and then begin to say now he was a wonderful person he was this he was that john is telling us there is a sin unto death he has committed that sin he died in that sin there's a final death after that sin and i do not say he will pray for that look at that look at this now it's uh, telling us look at that verse 16 again if any man see his brother his sister his neighbor sinner is sinner which is not unto death he shall ask and he shall give him life that means god we cannot give anybody life but you know as we pray we can become the channel of that life and the channel of that spiritual renewal restoration and the channel of that life that comes from the lord he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death there is a sin unto death i do not say that he shall pray for it now you understand all unrighteousness is sin and when there is sin there is backsliding when there is sin we need confession and forgiveness when there is sin we need a restoration to the grace of god and to the family of god and to fellowship with god yet the final death has not taken place that's why it says all unrighteousness is, is a sin and there is a sin not unto death we'll explain further as we come today we're talking about we're, we're teaching on this a passage and it is the confidence of the righteous in god the confidence that the righteous people have in god we're born again we're children of god we're members of the family of god and we come and we can have confidence in the sight of god because he called us and he invited us to pray he said call unto me and i will show you great Great and mighty things that thou knowest not. And because has invited us, and invited us with a great a promise that whosoever will come to me, I will in no wise cast out. He's giving us the promise, he's giving us the call, and so we come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain help to find help in the time of need. The confidence of the righteous in God. Who are the righteous? Not the self-righteous, not the goody, goody people. People, not the people that said I'm better than this and that. The people who have confessed their sins and the people who have given up their sins and the people who know that Jesus Christ is the only righteous one, the righteous savior, the righteous redeemer. And we are sinful and then we confess our sins unto God and we look at the lamp of, of God that taketh away the sins of the world and we say because of him, because of him we receive forgiveness and we receive eternal life and we receive salvation those are the righteous people there's an exchange there's a transaction we give him our sins he gives us his righteousness and that makes us righteous now such people who are being who have gone to calvary such people who have been to the foot of the cross and their sins are forgiven and they have assurance in their hearts the children of god those are the righteous the confidence in of the righteous in god God. There are three things we're going to talk about as we divide that passage. Number one, confidence in God for answered prayer. Confidence in God for answered prayer. Number two, communion with God and acceptable petition. When we come to God, we cannot just rattle some words and say this and that. We need to know what is acceptable in the sight of God. Acceptable petition. The petition we bring to him, the request we bring to him, and the problems we bring to him, and we're telling him that you are my God, you are my Savior, you are my Lord, you are my Father. I have 
confidence as I commune with you, as I, as I share my problems with you, and I throw my problems at the feet of the Lord. And it, then we commune with the Lord, communion with God, and acceptable petition. Point number three, constraint by God. Constraint by God. That word constraint means restriction. It says he restrains us in a way and he restricts us in a way and we're constrained that we cannot bring this kind of petition before the Lord, constrained by God concerning apostate perverts. Apostate perverts. We'll get to that when we come to that point. We're coming to point number one now. What's point number one over there on your outline? Confidence in God for answered prayer. He will answer your prayer. The promises of God are sure. And the promises of God are true. Look at what John is telling us. He's telling us in chapter 5 of 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 14. It says, this is the confidence we have in him. Can you see how sure he was? Can you see how, how definite that is? You are a child of God. You are a believer. You can say with John, this is the confidence that I have in him. When he says, this is the confidence we have in him. It's not only talking about himself. You could have said, this is the confidence I have in him. No, he brings you in. He says, every child of God, we're a family. And in the family of God, every son can go to the father, go to the mother, and every daughter can go to the father, go to the mother, and whatever they know that the father had promised and the mother had promised, they can confidently ask their parents. And that's what John is telling us. He says, are we not children of God? Are we not born again? Are we not members of the family of God? Why are we afraid? Why are we timid? Why don't we come to the heavenly father like all the people come and you see our fathers and mothers and our families they don't think about our class about our grade about this about that they give us what we need it's what they are promised and they're not thinking well he is a first born is last born is this is a boy is a girl if the true fathers and true mothers they give us what they are promised but the apostle is saying the same thing it says we who are children of god the same confidence that an apostle has should be the same confidence that the least member in the church should have and we should be able to say that's the promise of my father and he is my father as well as the father of an apostle he is my father as well as the father of an evangelist he is my father as the father of a leader as the father of a worker in the church whether I'm a worker or leader or member I'm a child of God and this is the confidence that we have in him, not outside him, not outside him. While we're in Christ, while we remain in Christ, while we abide in him, this is the confidence that we have in him. I pray that confidence, nobody will take it away from you. Look at uh, First John chapter 3, and I'm reading here from verse 20. From verse 20, it says, For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. It says, you know, what erodes our confidence? What makes us timid and fearful and frightened? Coming to the presence of the Lord in prayer, it says because our heart is condemning us. There's a monitor in our heart. There's a policeman in our heart. There is a person that is saying, uh -huh, look at this, look at that. And it's in our heart. And if our heart is condemning us, you settle that force because your heart is sin, you cannot bring your petition through because there's condemnation. There's condemnation. And so you settle that. And then in verse 21, beloved, if our heart condemn us not. That's the grounds of faith. If our hearts condemn us not. That's what gives us assurance. If our hearts condemn us not, that's what brings confidence. Then we have confidence toward God. If our hearts condemn us not, praise the Lord, I'm saved. Praise the Lord, I'm born again. And praise the Lord, I'm resisting temptation. Praise the Lord, whatever mistake and whatever fault, I've gone to the Lord Jesus Christ. He has assured me of forgiveness. And because of that forgiveness, my heart does not condemn me. And then it says, we have confidence in him. I pray that every confidence will be restored to us in Jesus. Jesus name. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Confidence. The confidence we have in God. For answered prayer. The confidence we have in God that he is a father. 
And Jesus is our Savior. Look at chapter 3 of Hebrews. I'm reading verse 6. Chapter 3 of Hebrews. And we're looking at verse 6. It said, but Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house we are. You see that? Whose habitation we are. Whose temple we are. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope from uh, uh, that is firm uh, unto the end it says that's why we have confidence it's not that people say i'm saved on sunday and then monday they've gone back to the world and then they come back the following sunday again oh god here we are i want to get saved again i've done what i shouldn't have done i've not done what i should have done they say they get saved again and then on monday they go back to their vomiting and not those people the people who hold fast their confidence in the lord there's a consistency in their lives there's a constancy in their lives and because of that consistently walking after the Lord and constantly looking at the way of the Lord, the word of the Lord, and they stand by that word, whether they're at home or in the office, in the church, at school, at college, anywhere, they stand by that. They say, this is where I stand. I stand on the word of God. I'm telling you, those people have confidence, and your confidence will remain and abide in Jesus' name. And we're looking at uh, verse 14. Look at verse 14 of that. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 14 it says for we are made partakers of christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence uh, steadfast unto the end it says we're made partakers of christ partakers of christ what does that mean partakers of every blessing he provided at calvary partakers of all the promises he gave on the on the cross of calvary partakers of everything he has provided everything he has purchased and everything he makes available for you and for me this we are made partakers of all those blessings of christ if we hold firm if we hold steadfast, if we hold fast, all that they were said to the Lord are confidence to the very end. And that's the reason it's very important for a believer to live a consistent life and to have a firm conviction in the word of God. There are people that, well, I go to this other church and we believe this too, we believe that too, but you know, we don't hold those things firm in some places. But when you hold it firm and you know that this is so and uh, whatever will happen and uh, whatever anybody will do or say temptation will come i'm holding fast persecution will come i'm holding fast opposition will come i'm holding fast those are the people that have confidence in the lord because they're working consistently they're not wobbling they're not falling and rising they're not people that are up today and down tomorrow today on the mountaintop and tomorrow in the valley they're consistently and constantly standing for the truth and walking by the truth and living by the truth such people have confidence in the lord when they come to pray and i pray that this firmness will come to every one of us is telling us in hebrews chapter 10 hebrews chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 35 hebrews chapter 10 we're looking at verse 35 look at what it says it says cast not away therefore your confidence you know there are times uh, you know you'll be holding firm tenaciously to the word of god holding firm tenaciously to the conviction of the word of God holding firm a very firmly to the word of God and then something happens to shake your confidence something happens to shake your determination something happens to shake your decision and your consecration to the Lord and then at that time you say can I stand now look at the winds that blow Look at the challenges I have. Look at my family situation. Look at what my friends are saying. And look at all the challenges and the fire I'm having from my office. And then we can sit away. It says, no, don't do that. Because you need that confidence every moment of your life. That's why it says, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience. That's perseverance. Ye have need of holding on or persevering or staying there you need the staying power that you stay and abide when the heat is on when the winds are blowing when the difficulties are coming and when the challenges are coming it says over here for ye have need of patience perseverance that after ye have 
done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Your answer will come. And that answer will not tarry. And so in the meantime, when there are challenges and difficulties, and it appears that the wind is coming and the storm is coming, and it appears that everything is going, it's going to be torn apart. That's the time to stand. Because just before the dawn, it might be dark a little bit. And just before the breakthrough, you might have those shakings and those difficulties. But you'll say, I will stand. Somebody there, I will stand. I said, I will stand. You stand in Jesus. And because yet for a little, a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tell you now. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, if any man draw back, my soul shall not have pleasure in him. Then it says, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. But... Of them that believe to saving of the soul. You'll keep on believing. And as you keep on believing, the power of the Lord will be manifest in your life in Jesus' name. And we're looking at First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 28. Confidence. Confidence in the Lord. And John, the beloved, says we have confidence in God. In First John chapter 2 verse 28. And now little children... Abide in him, that's the secret. Abide in him, that's the secret. Abide in him, that when he shall appear, we shall have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And let's come back to First John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 14 again. First John chapter 5 and verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will if we ask anything according to his will this is a secret of answered prayer if we're going to receive answers to our prayers we cannot go against the will of god god cannot say no to something in the bible and then we come with our puny self will and say god i know you're saying no to this but i say yes God looks down and says, who is that? Who is that aunt? Who is that rat? Who is that insignificant fellow? And the God of all the earth, the God of heaven and earth, and the God of creation that created this whole universe. And I said that this is not my will. I said this is not my way. I said this is not my desire. And somebody will say, you know, a pygmy. So to say, somebody with that little stature in, comparing, in, comp in comparison with the almighty God is saying yes to what God says. No, to, we must find, find out the will of God. That this is the will of God. And then we come to the prayer to point. And then we pray according to the the will of God, if we pray according to the will of God, when God says yes and we say yes, and those two words are the same, we're in agreement with God because two cannot work together. Tell me, except they be agreed. When you come to pray before the Lord, there must be that agreement. Find out what is the will of God, and then when you find out the will of God, you will you will then pray. I, John must have remembered. That is John the beloved. You must remember sometimes he prayed. Sometimes he asked the Lord. Because you see, John was a beloved disciple. And a beloved apostle. And it's like anything I ask Jesus, he must say yes to me. Because Jesus loved him. And in fact, the Bible says in the gospel according to John, that the disciple whom Jesus loved. And so he made, he assumed that, well, Jesus loves me. And because he loves me especially. And he shows that anytime they wanted to ask any question and uh, you know a uh, peter will tell him and say ask him that you see if all the other people are not able to ask because they felt that he will get any point through but you know john must have remembered look at mark mark we're looking at a verse chapter 10 mark chapter 10 i'm reading here from verse 35 mark chapter 10 and we're reading from verse 35 in verse 35 it says and james and john the sons of Zebedee, and they come unto him, they come unto Christ, saying, Master, 
we would we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we ask whatsoever we desire here john came with confidence you know boldness and you know assurance that i can't ask him anything that will not give me but you know you must always find out the will of god the will of god because god has exalted his word above his name and if you contradict the word of god and the will of god no matter who you are god does not play favoritism here comes now look at verse 36 and he said unto them what would he that i should you for you then said uh, they said unto him grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left and in thy glory and jesus said unto them you know not what ye ask ask him for something they knew not they didn't find out the will of God, the mind of God, the decision, the desire of God. Before coming to us, he know not what he asked. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, tell me. We can, we can, we can. Whatever it will take, whatever the price will be, will pay the price. We can. And Jesus said unto them, He shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the say with, with the baptism that I am baptized with withal, shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand. And on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. You see that? Jesus said, no, you can't have that. You didn't find out the will of God, the mind of God, the decision of God. You just came and you're thinking, I'm his favorite and he knows me, and I know him. Anytime I want to ask anything, I can ask. And after, after all, it's whatsoever, whatsoever. That whatsoever is qualified by the will of God. You find out, is it the will of God? That's why John now, having lunch is lesson. That's why John is saying, I learned my lesson. I thought I could just go to the Lord and ask anything, whether it's his will or not, but I've learned my lesson. It must be according to the will of God. Look at James chapter 4 verse 3. James chapter 4. We're looking at verse 3. It says, uh, James chapter 4 verse 3. Are you there? Are you opening your Bible? I said, are you opening your Bible? Joy, James chapter 4 verse 3. It says, ye ask and tell me, receive not. Because she has come is, that she may consume it upon your lusts. It says, you're not thinking of my glory. You're not thinking of my exaltation. You're thinking selfishly for yourself. You're not even thinking of the whole body of Christ. You're not thinking of the need of another brother or the need of another. You're not thinking about the standard of the word of God. You're not thinking about holiness. You're not thinking about heaven. Just about yourself. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me this. I don't know what you're asking. It says she has can receive not because you ask a means that she may consume it upon your loss. But when you find out what is the will of God, when you find out what is the promise of God, when you find out what does God have for me in particular that is going to give me so that I can pray, pray in the spirit and pray according to the will of God. And that's why the spirit need to help, help us. Because the spirit, when it helps us in Romans chapter 8 verse 27, Romans chapter 8 verse 27, when the spirit is helping us he makes us to pray according to the will of God makes us to pray according to the will of God Romans chapter 8 and verse 27 it says that he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the might of the spirit because he maketh intercession for for the saints according to how According to the will of God. You see, that's prayer, that's prayer, that's prayer. According to the will of God. Uh, sometimes you hear about, you know, some people, they say they are prophets. 
and they see that they are prayer warriors, not in this church. You know, the prayer warriors are everywhere. And sometimes they, they just say, they even sometimes write in the papers and they say, bring your request, whatever it is, we will pray for you and God will answer. And these people know next to nothing about the Bible and about the will of God. And then so, some people go to them and they say, what do you want? It says there's somebody in my office and that person is, uh, you know, a pain in my neck and son in my flesh. I want him to die. And this uh, so-called prophet will say, when do you want him to die? How, how long do you want him to live? And then they'll say, I want him to get off uh, from that, from this earth. In one month, they say, okay, can you pay this amount? I'll pay anything. And then they give them the money. You know, those are traders. Those people are praying to eat. They are not praying according to the will of God. If you pray that somebody should die, that person is not saved yet. You want him to die and go to hell. That's not the will of God. Even if the person is saved, the child of God, you want a child of God to die and you are praying to God. You are saying, God, this is one of your children. I'm praying to you. I know you are his father. I want you to kill him. It's like coming to a father on your street, on your community and say, uh, Father, you know, one of your children offended me. And I don't want to touch him by myself. I want you, yourself, the father, to kill that your son for me. Will the father do that? And the, the people that are going to God and they are saying, God, I don't, I don't like uh, Pastor so-and-so. I don't like uh, Sister so-and-so. I don't like so-and-so. So, God, I know you as far. I know he's born again. I know he believes in holiness. And I know that, you know, he's uh, walking holy and righteous. But, you know, I don't like him. Because I don't like him, kill him for me. Will God kill him for you? That's not the will of God. We must pray according to the will of God. There are many things we can pray for. There are a thousand and one things we can pray for. Why are you going to pray for things that God will not answer? You know, somebody says, you know, I know God said I shall come and he will give me anything. And then, um, you know, uh, it's read in the papers and he's been, you know, looking for a wife to marry. And of all these uh, beautiful sisters, you know, you cannot find the one there. He says, I don't want somebody black. I want somebody who is white. And uh, so he goes to pray and he says, God, I just heard that our president went to China and, uh, you know, came back. And now that Chinese uh, currency is going to be flowing between Nigeria and, uh, and uh, China. And you said we can ask anything. Lord, I give you date from this time to six months time. I want to marry a Chinese. Uh-huh. Once a Maria Chinese, do you know their language? No, I don't know. Have you ever been there? I've not been there. Do you even have passport? I don't have passport. God can do anything and everything. Uh -uh, stay over here. God has somebody for you to marry here. You get the point I'm making? The people that just pray, they don't know the will of God. They're not finding out the will of God. This is what I want. No, the prayer doesn't work that way. You'll find out what's the precept of the Lord, the promise of the Lord, the provision of the Lord, and then you pray according to the will of God. And I'm telling you tonight, God is going to answer your prayer. Praying according to the will of God. What do we know to be the will of God? Look at Second Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, and I'm reading here from from verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long suffering towards what? Not willing that any should perish. You see that? Not willing that any should perish. Not willing that anybody should die in sin. Even your enemy is not willing that that person should die and go to hell. And even the people that oppose you or persecute you is not willing that any of them shall perish and go to hell. So, going to pray that God will hurt them, destroy them, kill them, is not going to be answered. If anything happens to them, God has not answered you, Satan has answered you. And if Satan is answering you, guess where you are. Guess who you are. I pray you'll not go to Satan's side. It's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When we're praying for somebody to be saved, we're praying according to the will of God. When we're praying, oh God, if this is what this fellow needs so that he'll get saved and come to you, do it for him. We're praying according to the will of God. If this sickness is what is disturbing this fellow, if this joblessness is what is disturbing this fellow, and if we, you give him a job or you heal him, if that will draw him 
him to you and get him saved. Oh, oh Lord, please heal him and please give him a job. That's according to the will of God. This person has a problem child and this sin is not allowing him to even concentrate or come to the Lord or give his life to the Lord. If healing this child is going to help this man or this woman to come to the Lord so that they will not perish, oh Lord, heal the child. We're praying according to the will of God. Whatever will help the people to get saved. Whatever will help them to come to repentance. Or it may be a brother or a sister will see that you know is working for God and has been working for God. But sometimes a problem arises and because of that problem now he's cold and then he's dragging his feet and then you go to him and uh, you say my brother what's happening to you? Sister what's happening to you? He says you will not understand. I'm, I'm going through something. That there's fire burning somewhere. And then you go to God in prayer on his behalf. You say Lord this person is a great a soul winner but this thing is dragging him uh, you know off his feet if this problem if it is solved and it will make him to be on fire for God alone again oh Lord please uh, solve the problem we are praying according to the will of God we're looking at first Timothy chapter 2 First Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 3 and verse 4. First Timothy chapter 2, and we're looking at it from verse 3. In verse 3, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have, how many people? Tell me out loud. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see that? We know how to pray because he wants all people. This is the will of God. He wants all people to come to the knowledge of the truth and to be saved. And if we're praying that whatever will help them and drive them to Calvary, whatever will help them and keep them at Calvary, whatever will help them and keep them in salvation, bring them to salvation, bring, to keep them in that salvation, that's the will of God. But he if we're praying for all the things that will hinder people from knowing the Lord, if we're praying for something that will hinder people from uh, staying with the Lord, that's not according to the will of God. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3, it says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Even your holiness, we know what to pray for. We know that this is the will of God. Anything that will help them to be holy, help them to be sanctified, help them to be purified, help them to stay in a blameless, righteous life, that's the will of God. And it says, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Let's come back to First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, I'm reading here from verse 14 and verse 15. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in him. Now you have confidence in him. I said, now you have confidence in him. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. He heareth me. He will hear you in Jesus' name. And if we know that he heareth us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. We have the petitions that we desired of him. Look at chapter 3, verse 21. Chapter 3, verse 21. That's First John chapter 3, verse 21. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God and whatsoever we ask we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight our lives uh, match with the word of God we are walking straight and walking uprightly and because of that we know that God delights in us we abide in his word and we are praying according to his will according to his word and according to his provision and promise because of that we know that the Lord is going to answer our prayer we have the petitions we desired of him we are looking at John chapter 15 John Chapter 15, I'm reading here from verse 7. John chapter 15, we're looking at verse 7. John chapter 15, reading from verse 7. It tells us in verse 7, it says, If ye abide in me, 
and my words abide in you. You see that? There's a condition here. There's something God is looking for here. There's something God is expecting here. And he says, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Look at verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit you'll produce. I said you'll bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain your fruit will abide and that whatsoever ye shall ask of the father in my name he may give it to you tonight he will answer your prayer and as you pray according to the will of God there will be no disappointment in your life in Jesus name we're coming to point number two now point number two communion with God and uh, acceptable petition communion with god and acceptable petition we're looking at first john chapter 5 and we're reading from verse 16 it says if any man see his brother sin is sin which is not unto death he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Let's look at that verse because it says he, him, his and all that. And look at that verse as I read now but pay attention. If any man, if any believer, any child of God, anyone that will be, well we're talking about him from verse 14 and verse 15 and he's talking about the person that has confidence in God, the one that knows the word of God, the one that knows the will of God. If any man like that any believer see his brother see a fellow believer see a brother or a sister see a child of god sin a sin which is not unto death which is not unto final death it's not ananias thank god your brother is not ananias and your sister is not sapphira and yet the final death has not come and the perpetual death has not come the permanent death has not come the eternal death has not come it says if a brother a child of god see a brother your sister sin is sin which is not unto perpetual death he the brother who saw him shall ask he will not gossip he will not go to other people hey how many years do you have i saw something I saw somebody. You will not believe this. Brother so and so. See what he did. I saw it. He cannot deny. I saw it like this. And I told him. I will tell people. He, he didn't tell. He didn't talk about those people. He's not talking about those who gossip. Those who whisper. Those who go here and there. I saw sister so and so. I saw brother so and so. He said he shall ask. That means he shall pray. And then he says. And he shall give him. That means and God who answers prayer. God will answer your prayer. When you pray for a backslider, you don't, if you don't gossip, if you are concerned, if you have a deep heart in your mind, and you say, brother so-and-so, we love him, sister so-and-so, we love her, and see what she's going through, if you don't gossip, if you're not going about and saying, well, I know the secret, I know what happened, I know what did not happen, if you will pray, he shall ask, and then God will give him life for them that sin, not unto death, that is not unto perpetual Actual death. Look at verse 17. All of righteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. Now, what does that mean? There's a sin not unto death. Does that mean, aha, uh -huh, okay, there is a sin not unto death. I'm going to get a list of those sins because I know these sins are not unto death. And then I'm still a Christian. I'm still a believer. And then somebody catches you doing something wrong, sinful. And he says, see what you have done. Hey, don't accuse me. You know what? The sin I've committed is not unto death. And then he does another sin, and then you try to correct and say, brother, looks like you are becoming careless in your life. Look at what you've done. Uh -uh, uh, don't, uh, I know the Bible now. Because now I know there is a sin not unto death. The one I have done is not unto death. And it's going about like that. That fellow is misinterpreting scripture. Am I right or is he right? I said, is that backslider right or am I right? Uh -huh. because uh, you know the people that go about and they take the bible they use the bible as an excuse for sinning the soul that sinneth tell me it shall die the wages of sin is 
death. But you see, this is the window of the mercy of God. This is the window of the grace of God. And we don't, you know, we don't go through the window every day. It's a window. It's just an opening that the Lord has said, should there be an emergency that there's going to be confusion? Should there be an emergency and the devil is saying, aha, you have done it, you will die. You will never be saved again. God will never forgive you. It is final. It is final. You can jump out through that window. This one is not the door. This is not where we go through the door every day and every time. The grace of God is there because they say the grace that brings salvation has appeared unto tell me all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live soberly, godly, righteously in this present world. And we're looking for the coming of the Lord. But let us understand, should anybody have temptation and then the fellow sins and then the devil is saying it is final, then you will say no. This is the window of opportunity for me to escape. And this is the window of the mercy of God and of the love of God. Thank God I'm still alive. After that sin, I'm not happy that I sinned. I'm not happy that I did something wrong. But after that sin, thank God I didn't die. I will not die. I said I will not die. Say it for yourself. You will not die. You will not die in sin in Jesus' name. At that time, you now run to Calvary because you know that God has still kept you alive and God still has a purpose for keeping you alive. And whatever you ask, the Lord will forgive in Jesus' name. And that's what he's talking about. Let me explain this with the Bible. I'm looking at uh, Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. And we're looking at verse 13. Numbers chapter 12 and we're reading here from verse 13 numbers chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 13 it is the story of miriam what happened to her in the wilderness on the way to the land of promise it says and moses cried unto the lord saying heal her now O god heal her what happened aaron and miriam gossiped I back, back, back uh, bited against, um, against uh, Moses. And then uh, God called them and said, come to the temple, uh, to the tabernacle. Then they came and said, why have you done this? Because I know Moses is my servant. And he's a man that is humble and meek. Look at verse 7. And my servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all my house. And eventually leprosy came on Miriam. If a man sees his brother or his sister, sin is sin, which is not unto death. You know, many people, when they, when they sinned in the Old Testament, they were killed. Those people, that serpents came and killed them. But Miriam's case was not like that. And those people that murmured and then they were killed, Miriam was not like that. Korah, Desan, and Abiram, when they sinned, they died immediately. And it, her case was not like that. If you see any brother or any sister, sin is sin. Which is not unto death. Leprosy came, and then Moses understood, I will pray. And he prayed, and after about seven days, that leprosy was taken away, and then they can go on their journey again, and God will answer our prayers for our brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. We're well, looking at Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9, I'm reading here from verse 20. You remember Aaron, when Moses went to the top of the mountain to receive the law from the hand of the Lord, then Aaron did something and made a call for the people and that's what uh, Moses is referring to now uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 20 and the Lord was very wroth, very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him, to have killed him and I prayed for Aaron and uh, the same, uh, also the same time. He said, that, that's what he said. He, as Moses saw Aaron, that Aaron had committed sin. And this is idolatry. And normally for idolatry like that, he should have died. But God had not killed him. God has spared his life. And then Moses said, I will pray for him. When you see your brother, when you see your sister, they've done something they shouldn't have done. And then by the grace of God, you still have the grace of God in your life. You still have the confidence to pray. And 
he is so dejected, he's so disappointed in himself. And why should I do that? And she's so disappointed in herself. Why should I do that? And while they have lost confidence, and while they have lost the, the, the energy to pray, the confidence to pray, you still have in the confidence. You'll take them to prayer and you take them to the Lord, and the Lord will answer your prayer in Jesus' name. And that's what he's telling us that when you see somebody who has sinned, you will not gossip, you'll not backbite. What you will do is to take them to the Lord in prayer and the Lord will restore them in Jesus name. We're looking at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 31. Luke chapter 22. We're reading from verse 31. It says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon. And uh, Satan, behold, Satan has desired to have you and that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. You see the example of Jesus Christ. It has not even happened. But Jesus knew it was, it was going to happen. And he said, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen in thy brethren. Eventually because Peter was not watching. He was not watchful. That thing happened. And then look at what happened. We're looking at verse 61. In verse 61, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. He sinned. He told a lie. He even cursed. He said, I don't know Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus said? If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the angels of God in heaven. But he prayed for him. And when that thing happened, although Jesus was going to Calvary, he was bearing his own cross, although he was going through pain and suffering, but he still remembered Peter. What a lesson for us. Uh, you know, brother so-and-so is having a challenge. Sister so-and-so is having a challenge. And you have your challenge too you but thank god you can still pray but brother so and so maybe he's tired he cannot pray again sister so and so is that she cannot pray again but you can still pray you will forget your own problem if a brother sees brother if any man sees brother sin is sin which is not unto final perpetual death he shall ask and god will give him life for them that have sinned not unto death and so Jesus Christ in verse 16, it says, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Behold, and before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out, and tell me the rest, went bitterly. Was he forgiven? Was he saved? Was he restored? Of course, he was restored. Jesus had prayed for him, but he still had to repent. You see, our prayers alone cannot restore a backslider. Our prayers alone cannot save a sinner. The sinner must still repent. The backslider must still repent. But our prayer will soften their heart. Our prayers will draw them to Calvary. Our prayers will bring conviction upon them. Our prayers will make the Holy Ghost to convict them and drive them on their knees, drive them to their knees, and they will be saved in Jesus name and so when you've seen somebody done something wrong when you've seen somebody go the wrong way you will pray and God will answer our prayers and save them in Jesus name we we'll come to point number three now which is constrained by God concerning apostate perverts apostate perverts are you seeing that word apostate as an adjective to cover uh, to qualify the pervert? You can do that. It says, uh, look at this in First John now, chapter five. First John chapter five. We're looking at uh, verse uh, sixteen. First John chapter five, verse sixteen. If any man sees brother, sin is sin, which is not unto death. He shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Do you understand that now? Uh -huh. Look at the last part. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. 
And John wants to balance up everything. He wants to tell us that uh, there are people that pray. They, they think they're doing what is right. Uh, let's say, for example, somebody has died in uh, our community. And we know that the fellow was, uh, you know, doing something wrong. In fact, he went to, uh, he was on an errand. He was on a job this night, a job uh, to destroy other people and to take other people's property. And then as the shootout came, eventually he was gone down and he died. And then they now all the relatives now they pick him up because what has happened has happened and they bring him to the church. And their church will look at the records and say, yes, his name is um, such and such, it's a Christian name. But uh, there's only one problem that since he was baptized and since uh, he was confirmed, he has not been consistent in the church. If he had been consistent, he should have uh, paid this due and this due and this due, but he did not pay. And the relatives said, no problem, how much is it? And then they mentioned the amount and the relatives bring out money and they pay for him. And after the money has been paid, they will, meanwhile, the fellow is in the mortuary and after about uh, two months in the mortuary now they may call the arrangement and you know the priest now wants to come and pray remember the fellow died he went out uh, you know shooting and all that and he died in sin he didn't have any chance to repent he just died right there and now the priest uh, now comes and he says here yeah, we're gathered today and uh, this can happen to anybody and uh, our is our member and uh, it's now a faithful member because all his relatives they had done his, uh, his part for him and everything is now alright but we know how he was uh, when he was uh, wasn't consistent wasn't coming here very well and so everybody were going to pray and as we pray now that God will transfer his soul and transfer it to paradise that this will be one of the sons of Abraham. He will be in Abraham's bosom. And then he will, because uh, if God shall mark iniquity, who will stand? We all, we're all sinners. And he this is one of us. And he's also a sinner. And so let us pray that God, you know, I read my part, you read your part. I read my part, you read your part. And then I find out in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Ghost. And everybody said, Amen. And then it's okay. Relatives, don't worry again we are prayed he has gone to heaven is that how to go to heaven that's what john is telling us he said there is a sinner unto death i do not say that he shall pray for that it's like ananias i do not say he shall pray for that it's like sapphira i do not say he shall pray for that you will not die a backslider you know somebody if somebody happens to be a born again christian and then he becomes sick. As he got uh, sick now, the relatives uh, came and said, ah, this uh, white medicine hospital will not handle this one. This one requires traditional help. And heaven helps those who help themselves. You know where that is in the Bible? It's not in the Bible, but that's what they say. They say, even God said, even God said, heaven helps those who help themselves. My friend, God has not said that. It's not in the Bible. But then they take him, and then they take him to do rituals and ceremonies and everything. And he's come back into occultism, into idol worship. And eventually, in the shrine of the herbalist, he died there. In idolatry, in occultism. And then the relatives, uh, they come, they come to tell us, they say that, come and carry your member. It's your member. They say, come and carry your member. And then they say, okay, because if you don't do it, we know that he's a member of your church. We know that he, he was, his whole life was in your church. Only that when he became sick, he went, uh, you know, to that place. And maybe somebody will then say, and if we don't do this now and do this ceremony, we don't know what the people of the world will say. What will they say? Whatever they say, whatever we do, nothing will happen because he died in sin. If anyone goes like that, and while in the process of that sinning, he died like that. That's what John is telling us. I do not say that he shall pray for it. And you will not die in a shrine. Amen. You will not die in a herbalist tent. Amen. If we're going to die, if Jesus tarries, you will die in the Lord. Amen. So that when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. And we which are alive will be caught up together with them. You'll be there in Jesus name. 
There's another side to this. You know what Jesus said? And let me read this to you. We're looking at, uh, we're looking at what Jesus said in um, the word of God. This is Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. We're reading from verse 31. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. The Lord Jesus Christ was talking to the Pharisees because uh, they had said that what he did was doing by the spirit of Beelzebub, by an evil spirit. And so Jesus Christ told them, Matthew chapter 12, verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, uh, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Hold, hold on to that. Hold on to that. Once you are still alive, all manner of sin, all manner of blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. And if you have sinned, the Lord will forgive you. I wanted an amen there. Look at this verse that one. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven neither in this world nor in the world to come. Those are apostates. Those who know that Jesus Christ, his name is walking wonders. Those who know that Jesus Christ is the Holy One and that Jesus came in the flesh and he is the Christ. And then they turn around and then they accuse him of being possessed of evil spirit. And they say that all that Jesus Christ did, it was by the evil spirit. He says, well, if you speak against me alone, against Christ alone, you'll be forgiven once you repent. But if you speak against the Holy Ghost, there's no forgiveness on earth or in heaven. That's the unpardonable sin. And John was there. John was there when Jesus was saying that. That's why he said, there is a sin unto death. John, what's that? He said, those who speak against the Holy Ghost, and those who accuse the Holy Ghost of walking by the power of Satan, he said there's no forgiveness here on earth or in heaven or anywhere or anytime. How do we know that we have not committed the sin against the Holy Ghost? Because sometimes the, the devil is very crafty. We don't want to say clever. The devil is deceptive. And the devil will say, uh -huh, that thing you did, that thing you said, you've committed sin against the Holy Ghost. How do you know you have not committed sin against the Holy Ghost? It's the Holy Ghost that brings conviction for sin in our heart. That makes us sorrowful that we said something wrong. It's the Holy Ghost that makes us sorrowful that we went the wrong way. It's the Holy Ghost that made us feel that's not right. That's not holy. That's not righteous. I should I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. Once the conviction of the Holy Ghost is still there, you have not sinned against the Holy Ghost. Because if you have sinned against the Holy Ghost, he'll abandon you. He'll forget about you. He knows you'll not be forgiven, so he will not waste his effort. He'll not waste his time coming, bringing conviction of sin against your life. Once there's conviction there, and you're saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Apostates don't say they're sorry. Perverts don't say they're sorry. Those who have said, let what happened will happen, whatever will happen, I'm ready for it. They don't say they're sorry. Once there's something you had and saying, oh Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive this is terrible. How could I do that? If people hear this now, this will not be an encouragement to them. Once you have any feeling like that, you have not sinned against the Holy Ghost, you are praying, God will answer your prayer. We are praying for you, God will answer our prayer. And you will come back and be restored in Jesus' name. The only thing is that you shouldn't continue and continue and continue and become hardened in sin. Don't allow the deceptiveness of sin to hinder you and to harden your heart. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, and we're reading here from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 12. It tells us in verse 12, 
warning us to be careful so that we do not go too far in uh, the way of righteousness. It says in verse 12, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. While the grace of God is still there, and while the Spirit of God is still communing with you, be very careful you do not depart from the living God. It says, but exhort one another daily, while it is called to day lest that lest any of you should be tell me hardened sin hardens people sin hardens people lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sins we're coming back as we conclude to first john chapter 5 verse 14 this is the confidence we have in him somebody there today has confidence in god that God will answer your prayer. That God loves you. That the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ for you in Jesus' name. And all those prayers you have been praying for all this while that has not been answered, today is the day of the answer. Because this is the confidence that we all have in God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we, and if we know, do you know? I said, do you know, if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. This is your day. And God is going to answer your prayer. All those things I'll be telling the Lord, just, just, just bring everything together, bundle everything together, and say, God, I stand on your promises, and I know you will not deny me. He will not deny you. He will give you joy in your heart, happiness in your life, and victory in Jesus' name. All those things that disturb your life, the Lord will crush them out of your life in Jesus' name. He will say yes to you. You say, yes, I know you. You are my son. You are my daughter. And if there's anything you've done which you feel unhappy about or feel guilty about, you say, merciful God, come to the throne of grace. This is the day of answered prayer. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. He wants to answer your prayer. He wants to hear you pray. And he says, I've been waiting for you. I'll take that burden away. I'll take that problem away. And I will take that heartache away. You must have confidence in the Lord. This is the the confidence that we have that if we ask anything according to his will he the almighty god heareth us today is your day he will answer your prayer open your mouth and pray